Hello, hello, how's it going? So glad you found your way into the Thursday sketch session. I almost said Wednesday, I'm a little bit out of the time. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad you decided today it's time to draw and that you decided to hop on here to make it happen. Let me just um, wait a brief second to make sure I'm actually live. Okay, I'm seeing myself over here. And I see myself over there, excellent. So we are set to go. Welcome, in case you're here for the very first time, my name is Carolyn Peters. I'm the owner of Cura Studios, which is an art studio in Orange. <clears throat> if you are a regular, hey, what's up? Glad you're back. Um, in case you're a first timer though, let me just give you a brief summary of what these sketch sessions are for, how I conduct them. Um, they're weekly, they're always on Thursdays, and I rotate between different subject matter. So figure, portrait, nature, and then inanimate things. And every week I bring a different focus. So today we'll talk portraits in specific. We'll focus on midtones and even more in specific, how to um, model midtones, how to build midtones by using what's called cross contour hatching or planar hatching. So um, the reason why I like to have these sort of like very focused, um, uh, directed drawing sessions is because it's kind of like going to the gym where you have a coach making you do all the things that you kind of don't want to do when you're working out on your own. Um, so we can grow together. Um, these are things that I feel like I need to strengthen and uh, if I can kind of bring you up with me, then um, even better. Um, so as I said, we're working on portraits tonight. I have two pictures lined up, but we may just get to one because it does take quite some time to get into a full mid-tone rendering. So before we jump in, let me just give you a little bit of the lay of the land, what, you're ha what you have to plan for when your goal is to draw a portrait where you have full values. So. You've probably heard all kinds of terms being thrown around among artists. Values, tones, shadows, light, mid-tones, smudging, sfumato, um, and the list goes on and on. It gets really confusing knowing what people are even talking about and if things are the same. So today, um, I wanna kind of be clear about when you wanna do a portrait and your goal in the portrait is to have a full value spectrum or like, you know, a fuller, it doesn't have to be the full one, but like a fuller value spectrum than just line, you have to understand how value works. So last week we talked about one element of value and that was that shadow pattern. So if you were here, you caught that session, we talked about shadow patterns, that's one element of creating a full value drawing. Now there are two more elements that make a full value drawing. One is um, what's called form modeling or transitions, like modeling the gradations from dark into light. And then the third thing is what's called local value. Local value is the easiest to understand because um, that's basically just the pigmentation of something. Um, if you have black hair and you have that black hair against your light skin, um, that's a local value difference. Easy to address because you just shade it in one even tone. Um, areas where you have local value differences in a portrait would be um, the nose is often redder because there's more blood there, it gets more sun exposure, lips are definitely darker than the cheeks because of the pigmentation, so that's local value. We're not going to talk about it very much today, even though it does factor into building your midtones, but what we will talk about is um, form modeling, how to render planes, how to, and not, not airplanes, I <laughs> mean last night uh, one of my students made a little comment about that, not airplanes, um, I mean planes in terms of like the facets of our body and how like the, the, the facet of the nose here angles differently than this facet, than this facet, than this facet, like every um, surface of our face has a different angle. And with those different angles, we get different values. So I wanted to just lay the land that that's kind of what I'm thinking about. That's gonna be going on in the back of my head as I'm drawing. And um, so let me switch cameras real quick. Um, 
this is the one I need. I'm gonna move this to the side, my notes, and hit this little button right here. Okay, so I just wanted to start with this image by an artist called Jean-Baptiste Greuze. Let me just move over here and pop that into the chat. Um, you should look him up. He's a master draftsman from the Baroque era. And um, so you see how he is building um, mid-tones by using these kind of hatch marks. So these hatch marks, they go along with the facets of um, whatever surface he's describing. And he's being very clear about which facets are angling more directly at the light and less directly at the light and which facets are totally in shadow. So that is what I'll have in the back of my mind as I'm drawing and um, my result will be nowhere as beautiful. I will promise you that, but I will have that in the back of my mind aiming for that. So here's our reference for tonight. The first one we'll be working from. This is Bonita and uh, I'm just thrilled to be drawing her. And so let's get started because you know, an hour is very little time. So let me show you the pencils I'm working with. Um, these are, um, not sure if you can see these, um, they're called Creta Color Nero's. And they're a really nice blend um, between charcoal and graphite. It's not really graphite in there, but um, it has the feel of a graphite. So it gives you more control and it's not as, as smudgy as uh, a regular charcoal would be. Okay, so in case you weren't here a month ago when we did portraits, focusing on the underlying structure, you definitely wanna catch that video. So um, I usually leave up the live streams except the figure drawing ones. Um, so you can, after this one, if you're like totally in the drawing mood, um, binge and go to the next one. And um, actually this should be the first one, the one from last month, because it talks about the underlying structure or the underlying foundation rather of, of your portrait and how to set yourself up for success, like how to build an armature that uh, will give you like some solid guardrails to work with. Let me just make sure this is focused. So, Right now it's very faint because I'm using very light pressure. When I know that I'll be working on a fuller value spectrum, I'm very mindful of how dark I go how soon. So, because I don't wanna end up with any marks that I can't erase later on. That will kind of fight me. And so what I'm working on right now is um, the underlying structure. So I'm thinking about, okay, the head is like a sphere with a facial mask, which is kind of like wedge-like. And I understand there's a side plane, um, side of the head moving into the front of the head. I am getting my center line that kind of curves with the curvature of the front of the face. And now I'm starting to work on some proportion guidelines. So even though likeness won't be um, my focus, it should still look humanoid, <laughs> ideally. So it should still look like a person. So I gotta put in those, um, landmarks. So the ones I put in is um, hair line, which is basically her headband in this case, brow line, base of the nose. So when I say base of the nose, I don't mean the tip of the nose. I mean the parts where the wings of the nose are growing out of the face and then chin. Gotta take a swig of water, I'm really thirsty. It's been very warm in my studio. 
So now this rhythm I'm drawing is um, an imaginary rhythm um, that goes from the top of the ear to the corner of the chin, but it's basically where the cheek transfers from the front of the cheek to the side of the cheek. And then I immediately draw the neck in because we want to have not just a floating head, we want to have, um, you know, <laughs> something that's rooted in, in, in a body. Not just a, a random floating egg. So I'm here thinking about the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Um, it's like this long rope-like muscle going from behind the ear towards the pit of the neck. Um, okay, that's, that's good enough. So now I'm building um, the... Well, now I'm drawing the hair, <laughs> but I was going to draw the foundations of the features and I'll get there shortly. Um, but hair shape, by the way, has a lot to do with somebody's likeness. So don't underestimate that. Our silhouette, like think about this, you're, you're, you have a date with somebody, one of your best friends, you're hanging out, you're meet, meeting somewhere in public. You see somebody walking toward you, most likely if it's your friend, you'll recognize them from really far away, even though you don't see their, their face yet, you don't see their features yet. And the reason why we can do that is because our brain is amazing at registering and remembering shapes, silhouettes. And so capturing somebody's hair shape is a very crucial part to a solid drawing, to a solid portrait, rather. So I know that most of you are probably going to be drawing at this point. Um, if you have a second, you're picking up a fresh pencil or sharpening your pencil, or you're just kind of taking a break, I would love it if you could pop in the chat if you have any favorite portrait artists, um, especially if you have any classical, as in like, you know, dead people, <laughs> any any artists from the past that you look to. Uh, I'd, I'd love to know about that. I'll share some that I like to um, look at. Well, the one that I put in the chat, that's a total must, um, especially for this kind of planar cross contouring method. And currently I'm really into Tiepolo. You know, I don't know how many portraits, portrait drawings he has, but I love his figure drawings. So he's been on my mind. Okay, you know how I talked about those facial feature foundations? I still haven't gotten them. So let's let's get to it. Let's let's snap to it. Um, let's work with the nose. So I'm thinking about where the wings of the nose um, grow out of the face in relationship to the tip of the nose. So if I had to make a judgment call where the tip of the nose turns from bottom facing to front facing, I'd make it here. And so I'm basically beginning with a simpler version of the nose that's almost more like a box. And I'm being very, 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 did I say very enough? <laughs> I'm very mindful as to how long I make that length of the box of the nose, how wide, and being careful about the difference between how much do I see of the left side and the right side. And then, so now I have the nose box, but the nose box uh, isn't finished or complete until we have it rooted into the eye socket. 
And we do that with the structure called the glabella. It's that kind of strange looking shape in between our brows. And this is the important part. Uh, so this is the front, that's easy to get. But then the important part is that you need to step down into the eye socket. This line, most beginners can't conceive of it. And so now, as you can see, I'm already thinking in terms of facets. So when you draw like this, when you draw in this planar centric manner, your drawings often aren't going to look all that pretty. And if you've been here before, you might be thinking, well, she says this a lot about when we're drawing, like that the drawings aren't going to be pretty. When are the drawings finally going to be pretty? And that's a fair question. <laughs> it's like, does she ever do pretty drawings? Uh, and I dare say I do, but not necessarily in the sketch sessions. Maybe sometimes the figure drawings turn out pretty. Uh, but like, again, I'm thinking about these sketch sessions as a workout, as a place to think through all that tricky stuff that will, when I sit down to work on my personal work, will make my personal work really strong. So, by the way, I, I am aware that our, our eyes aren't just circles. Um, this is, I'm just thinking here about the scale of the actual eyeball because I'll drape the lids over it. But just in case you're wondering, <laughs> what's this girl doing with, with, with the eyes? I'm not finished. And here I'm jumping ahead. I'm getting too excited about wanting to move forward. So I'll have to rein myself back in. So I worked on that nose structure and the glabella. I started to work on the eye socket and then kind of abandoned it. So let's finish it. Might as well. So eye socket is like this bony, bony structure, this kind of like shelf that protects our eyeballs. It recedes into the skull here. And then where the cheekbone is, you see that beautiful highlight on her cheekbone here? Um, that's kind of where the bottom of that imaginary heart conceived um, structure is. And then I'm gonna get into the, the muzzle or Artists also tend to call it the dental mound. It's like this half dome sitting kind of partially underneath the nose, kind of appearing out, and then ends where the chin dome is. So you see, I'm just kind of using some pancake shapes um, and let them meet. So the reason is because I want to think about the mouth not just as a uh, like stretching on forever and ever. I want, it, I want it to contain it. And the other thing I want to do is, I want to, as I'm building the mouth, think about the fact that the lips, they stretch over a rounded surface. Like our mouths are not flat. They stretch and dip down. And this is a little bit chef's still. That's a technical term for not quite there yet. <laughs> but it, I'm basically, I'm drawing the separating line in between the lips briefly. And what I mean is I, like the placement isn't quite right. So if this was about likeness, I would start futzing around with the distance in between the nose and the lip. But since I do want to get to um, the midtone 
quest. And I'm gonna let it go. She's not gonna look like Bonita, but you know, I hope she'll forgive me um, that I didn't capture her beautiful likeness, that I just kind of used her to learn something. But I'm, I'm sure she'd understand. She told me that she's been modeling professionally for over 13 years. So she gets it, that we artists are strange and focus on these very particular things. So I'm getting some details logged in. Looking at that wing of the nose curling under. And when I work on smaller parts, I allow my hand to um, hold the pencil like I'm writing my name. So when you're working small format, it's totally fine to hold your pencil like this. But as soon as you need bigger arcs, you want to switch to an overhand grip. F. This is still a little bit big. Okay, move on, Carolyn. Let's work on the eyes. So I have my general structure. Let's begin with this one. So the important thing is that you re respect what you did with the nose box. So I, I established that step down into the um, eye socket. Now you can't put, you can't go and put your um, tear duct in here. That would be physically impossible. So you need to see where does the nose box end and that's where your um, tear duct begins. And then pay close attention to the angles of the lid. Don't just expect it to look like the stereotypical almond eye. Once you have outer rim of the lid, get that lid crease. And that lid has a thickness and dare I say an outer facet, an outer plane. So as I'm building this, she's going to start to look a little bit like a, a robo person or let me think if there's another artist I can think about. Not artist, what am I? I'm, I lost my train of thought because I looked in the chat and I saw that you posted favorite artist. Lindsay said David, Ang, Gilbert Stewart, Copley. Awesome. I think out of all of them, I'd probably go with Stewart. Okay, so what I wanted to say is robo person. Not really robo person, but I don't know, strange facet person. <laughs> okay, so I got one eye pl plotted out. Shape isn't quite right. But I'm going to trace now over because I want to make sure that the two eyes relate. So I'm going to trace this lid rim over, the tear duct over, this lid over. And when I trace this over, I make sure it's parallel with all the other angles. Okay, so tear duct, again, tear duct has to be set off from your nose box. And um, to kind of pick back up from where I left off in terms of pretty drawings and these being kind of workout sessions where we create these kind of strange looking drawings that often aren't something that you want to pull out and show off to your friends. Um, like, I don't know, you know, there's something very inspiring about um, working with, with teachers who are just so good, you know, you just want to get as good as they are. And uh, I definitely encourage anybody to work with those amazing teachers. But sometimes it can feel a little bit like, oh gosh, this is so unattainable. Like I'll never get there. And then it's easy to feel like you're gonna give up, you know? And uh, like by, by struggling through these kind of awkward drawings with you, I just wanna show you, you know, like this is a person um, who, who teaches at a university level, um, who's been doing this for a while. And every once in a while she gets it right. But you know, she's still like, 
you know, struggling at times and she often doesn't know either. And, um, there's no shame and like, you know, constantly practicing, but that's how I like to look at, um, art that it's a practice, um, rather than it's a constant performance. It kind of has freed me up to work more, to have more fun when I worked, not get depressed about not being as good as some, as somebody else. So maybe it, this attitude can, can help you a little bit too. And maybe you don't struggle with that, then gosh, am I envious of you. <laughs> you gotta share your secret sauce with me. If that's you, it's just like, dude, I'm, I'm great and I can totally be the next master, then I wanna live in your head. <laughs> Okay, so you can see I'm building my facets. I worked a little bit on the outer edges. Um, and I think I'm almost ready to get into some value work, dare I say. But you know what I'll do? I'll sh bring another, I'll sharpen my pencil one more time. And I have this electric pencil sharpener, so you're gonna hear like this loud, strange noise. So don't. That's the sharpener. Let's bring this up here. That trapezius is higher. Okay. Am I pleased with this? <laughs> so I like to think of the drawing in different phases. Phase one is gesture. We just kind of get the direction and the size of things. Phase two is when you get the structure. Um, so like those plane changes, making sure proportions are accurate. And then phase three, you roll into the, the value phase where you have, um, you, where you bring it to a finish. And so before I roll into phase three, I make myself stop. And that's often the hardest part about drawing because we wanna keep drawing. I mean, come on, we're artists. We, we wanna move that pencil. Um, because you know that's also how people look at, well, drawing is when you make marks. Drawing is when you move that pencil. But you have to remember that drawing is just as much moving your pencil as it is stopping and using your eyes, moving your eyes in an intentional manner to catch anything that's not quite there. So something's bugging me about these eyes. And I know I'll have to let it go. I won't be able to perfect it. You know, I really want to. Yeah. I feel like I have to rip myself away from this. Um, one thing, as you're stopping yourself and kind of looking up and down between your reference and your drawing is um, you wanna first of all check, are all your features aligned as an art, are they all parallel? Eyebrows are parallel with the eyes, as in like from eye corner to eye corner to eye corner to eye corner. You don't wanna have this slanting down this way, this slanting up this way, all parallel nose attachment, lips, all of this needs to be parallel. That's one thing to check for. The other thing to check for is perspective. And no, don't worry, no like crazy lines going to vanishing points and such, but um, perspective in terms of whatever is closer to you, that needs to be the bigger one. <laughs> That's how I see perspective. Like you don't need anything else. So for example, this eye that's closer to me, that needs to be the bigger one from this one and right now it's not and that's bugging me. So, and same as like this side of the nose is closer to me, that needs to be bigger than this side of the nose. This part of the mouth is closer to me, needs to be longer than this part of the mouth. Okay, so we're at the halfway point. I think we'll just keep going with this pose through the whole evening, um, just because I wanna show you how far we can take it. All right, let's just say this is a really great underdrawing Let's move in the third phase. So um, what I said in the intro to the video, let me see if this is in screen, um, we have shadows, transitions, can you read my handwriting? 
and local value. So shadows, transition, so how you gradate out of the shadows into the lights and local value. Those three elements, that's how I like to think about what goes into a full value spectrum. And so I always begin with shadows. And so I chose this drawing because it kind of doesn't have very clear shadows. I mean, there is a shadow side and a light side, but it's so diffused that it's kind of tricky to, to decide where you're gonna put that, that shadow um, pattern. And so rather than, you know, only having your shadow pattern as something to work with, it's so nice to have that planar um, cross contouring up your sleeve because then you can just say, oh, what the hell? I don't know where the shadow is. I'm just going to cross contour hatch. So But at this point, I'm just, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you how I figure out that this is the shadow. I'm looking for clues in terms of like, do I see however faint someplace it cast shadow? So if you look at the cursor right now, do you see this? Super faint. It's not a big difference between here and here, but I see that edge. And that's that little giveaway that like, oh, there's a cast shadow on the right side. So that means the light's coming from the front left somewhere. And so I know that all these planes, they're not angling to the top left. They're not gonna have any light on them. So that's how I make this decision. Also under the nose, you can see right there, there's a little bit of a shadow. So I'm using those little clues. On the, this is the ball of the nose. So on the ball of the nose, I'd say the, the ball of the nose rolls into shadow right around here. And then the wing of the nose turns down to face down towards the ground around there. So this is gonna be my shadow pattern for the nose. Um, the whole See, this is where I'm not sure, like, is this left side shadow or not? Um, so, since I made a shadow here, I'm gonna hatch that later. So I, I did wanna just begin with some simple shadow patterns where I feel like I know where they are, and then any other questionable areas, I'm just going to um, cross contour hatch and see where that takes me. So let me fill in my shadows in the iris. Let that go. Okay, so as I'm starting to put some tone, so tone, you can use, let's, let's do it like this. Value is being created out of these three items. Value is the same word as tone. You can use those two interchangeable, interchangeably. And so I'm starting to put tone in where I think there's some, shadow, some true shadows. And whenever I put tone for a shadow mass down, I do so in a flat manner, meaning all my marks are going in one direction.
And I didn't think about this very well because now I'm going to smudge all over, but so be it. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to use this part. So you see the tubercle of the lip, that center pillow of the lip. Um, see how that leads up to the nose? I'm going to make that another shadow edge. So just I have another shadow here. Make the whole upper lip into a shadow. So if you're here last week, we talked about the power of shadow patterns to build form, to lend some structure. Um, that's what I'm working with right now. And then I'll get into some of that planar cross contour hatching shortly. I do want to make sure I address this since that's what I said I would be talking about, but it takes some time to get there. We're entering the serious zone. I'm sort of think a lot about what it is I'm doing. Where like this is where my like if this was a like gym workout, this is where my my muscles would start to shake. <laughs> There's something like, I have no idea what's happening with the shadows here, but I'll get to it with the cross contour shading. So um, let's see how to best explain this. Let's, let's draw a little, oh yeah, I know. Okay, so I was talking about facets earlier. Planes, facets, same thing. Um, if, if, if they're being hit by light rays, their angle to the light rays matters. So if you have a light source coming down from straight on top, this plane is going to be reached most directly by the light. Now this will, or this might still catch some light, but it's gonna be much darker, not a shadow yet, but it's gonna be darker than this plane and then this plane is going to be just as light as that one because it has the same angle to it and then this one it's angling up it's angling up more than that so it will be slightly lighter so let me say that one more time so you can hear it clearly on our face any part of our body we have planes that angle in different ways the planes that are angling most directly at the light source will be the brightest. So in, in the case of our portrait tonight, it'll be this forehead plane right here. It'll be that nose plane. Notice how they have the same orientation to the light. It'll be this part of the ball and nose here. It'll be this part, which I made way too short, this part on the uh, upper outer lip. Um, those are all angling like this, catching a lot of light. Now anything else is still catching a lot of light, just not as much. So, um, this here might still catch some light, but not as much as this here. So these might all still be considered mid-tones, lights, um, but they will have variation, and the variation depends on the angle of the plane to the light. 
So I hope that makes sense. And if the um, plane is angled away, like let's say in front of it was another sheet of paper. coming out like this, this here probably won't have any light reaching it because it's kind of upright, it's flush with the light mass. So this one as well as this one, these will all be shadows. So wherever the light rays can't reach, you consider that a shadow. Anything where they do reach, albeit at different angles, um, will be light mass, which is mid highlights and midtones. Hope that makes sense. So let's apply this over here. So I want to start in a place where I can kind of um, see things clearly. I always want to set myself up for success. So I'm going to start shading. And I'm going to, the way I'm applying my tone is with the direction of these planes. So if this is the edge of the plane, I'm trying to think about that and that's how I'm angling my marks. And I do this intuitively though. I'm not thinking about it crazy much. I'm just kind of letting my, my gut make decisions on that. So here under the eye, these are kind of upright planes. I'm going to sharpen my pencil one more time. Because it's a fairly small format and I don't want to lose my point. Okay, let's get in here with this. Angles. I'm going to get to the ball of the nose. So anytime you get to a new form segment, like ball of the nose is different from the length of the nose. Anytime you get to a different form segment, your, your facets will change. And the trick with this um, technique is to not have your model look too hairy. So here, see I, I'm, I'm angling down at a steep angle for the side plane of the nose and then I'm, I'm flattening out my angle as I get towards that under portion of the eye. Now I'm angling my marks up again for the upright lower lid. And here, let's go flat. So if you've ever sculpted in your life, and, and this is something that comes easily to you, um, that will intuitively really inform what it is that you're doing. And as I step down to the cheek here, it's this darker. So again, this area here that's angling at the way, angling away from the light more severely. And when I get myself out of the shadows, in general, I like to put most of my details in the light, but for some reason I'm getting all caught up in the shadows here, so I'm going to move over, move on forward um, to other areas. Okay. 
she says, and still keeps drawing the shadows. But I want to um, chisel that nose out a little bit more. Okay, so right now uh, I'm getting back up more into the mid-tone areas and I'm deciding um, what is darker and what is lighter. So do I think that the wing of the nose on the left side is lighter or do I think that the cheek is lighter? And the only way that you can tell is by looking relationally. Um, if you just stare at one, you won't be able to tell. You have to compare one to the other and ideally you want to triangulate between three different points. And so find the place where the two are touching each other and let your eye hop back and forth. And when I do that, I feel like the cheek is darker. The ring of the nose has some sort of reflected light on it. So that's how I'm doing that. Um, there's another artist that just came to mind who's really great at this cross contour hatching technique and that's Paul Cadmus. You should definitely check him out. Cadmus with a C. He does a lot of toned paper work. Um, really great drawings. Okay, let's get into the forehead. It's gonna be fun because there are some bigger planes so you have a facet angling this way. So I was mentioning this last night in my figure drawing class because we worked on something similar just on the full figure. Um, when you practice building mid-tones or if you practice this cross contouring technique, it's really great to work with darker skin models because they give us this rich base to work with and um, there's not this fear usually that we have like, oh, I'm going to get too dark too quick. You know, because they give us a um, lovely darker local value. So we, we, we kind of feel more at ease to put some tone on the paper than if you have like this super light skinned person and like, you know, you just want to leave the, the, the whiteness of the page mostly. So that's why this is a really per a perfect reference to work with. So notice how I'm applying my marks. So this is slanted away. This is kind of now flattening out and here slanting mildly in the other direction and now going into that shadow mass. So again, your marks go with the angle of the facets. If you want to figure out, well, how dark do I push my marks? That's something you have to build relationally. As I said just earlier, a couple of minutes ago, you want to compare several areas to each other. That's why it's so important to keep zooming out as you draw. So you can see things in context to each other. And then the other guideline I'll give you for that is um, reference your shadows so the areas where you know it's a shadow or your darkest darks like you know if it's a totally flat lighting 
like a photographer was in the room and they and they got rid of all the shadows, which is what professional photographers love to do. As artists, we like the shadows because they're so useful. Um, but you know, if the photographer was in the room, got rid of all the shadows, then you just work with your um, darks, like, you know, a dark local valley. So in this case, you'd use her hair, you know, it's, it's, it's a really rich dark. And so if you want to gauge how dark to make your marks, that's what you use as your landmark or benchmark rather. And um, the other thing I wanted to say is you, you build things gradually. So you never go in there and go, and this is how darkly I'm sh shading things with this off screen. Like this is how dark I'm, I'm shading things. Um, you kind of inch your way toward the, the value range that you think will be manageable. Um, if that makes sense. Okay, so on the nose, now there's a part of the nose that's angling up with up that wing. See, that's not catching so much light here, which is interesting. Then it's starting to catch light there, and then it tucks under. If you're wondering what I'm using here, this is a pencil eraser. Um, I like it that because you can sharpen it to a fine point. What's going on currently with it? I'm not sure if it's the brand or what, but uh, it's it has a tendency to smudge things. So I'm kind of not in love with that. I have to test out some other brands. Okay, so let's go here. God, it's bugging me that I didn't catch that length right. I go. So here, see this is angling to the left, then this is angling up at the light. Let's match this. And then here, the lip is starting to tuck under, roll under. Keeping an eye on the time, so we have about seven minutes left. So you can see this is a pretty um, time intense um, way of working. But as I showed you earlier, I mean, you know, um, Greuze, that guy that I showed you in the beginning, he's such a master. That was probably a fairly quick drawing for him because he did that all the time. So um, if we did these practice sessions more often, you know, we'd pick up speed too. We'd find a certain um, shorthands. But at this point, because I haven't drawn like this in quite a while, uh, it just takes some time. So again, how do I know how to angle my pencil? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know either. I'm, I'm basically trying to feel, if that makes sense, I'm trying to feel what angle the plane would be and I know this is such a wishy-washy way of saying it that like if I was the student in class and my teacher said that I would that was going to be would be one of those moments where I'd get like really annoyed it's like what do you mean you feel it <laughs> it's like um I I took a couple of figure drawing classes with Carl Ganass up in um LA and like when he does gestures he's all about like you gotta just feel like what the pose feels like <laughs> Like, okay, and I know what he means. Like, I mean, I get it, but it would be so nice to, like, can't you just give me the formula? You, you don't have a formula? Oh, that's why your art is so awesome. And that's why it's full of life. Oh, okay, fine. I guess I won't work with a formula. I'll just struggle through it. Um, if, if that, um, heightens the chances of me getting some just magical um, results, then that's that's worth, that's worth it, I guess. <laughs> so if you don't know who I'm talking about, um, Carl Ganass, um, really awesome figure drawing instructor, uh, I think Burbank. 
is where the studio's at. It's an animation guild. And he's online. You should totally support him. He's rad. Okay. So at this point, where I'm starting to get to a place where I have marks all over the, the drawing, that would be another time to pause, zoom out, and then kind of see like where are my darkest areas, kind of looking up and down, up and down for quite a while, asking where are my darkest areas. And in my drawing, like, is it completely unrelated? Like, because it, it happens like in the heat of the moment, in the heat of like trying to figure this stuff out. You, it's so easy to lose track of, of the entirety of the drawing. And so that's why it's so important to build in uh, moments of reflection and contemplation. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just like moments of like assessment, like, okay, now that I've, um, what's the, what's the past for dive, dive, dove, divin? No, that, that sounds wrong. <laughs> now that I dove into this drawing for a while, um, what, where did I get a little bit too dark? Where did, I, what, where did I leave tone off? So like right now I'm seeing, okay, this is a very bright spot. I know that, you know, it is a highlight area, but I, I need to kind of gradate more gradually into that. Dive, dove, dove. That's what I would say. So if you don't know me, I grew up in Germany. I came here for college. That's my that's my um, out on any time I say weird things. <laughs> it's like I didn't grow up here. <laughs> Although by now, you know, I should know. So right now I'm looking for other areas where I need more darks. So I want to get that iris much darker. So the iris, that's a local value. So local value, just like shadows, I shade them flat. And then I'm so glad this is here. Um, the white of the eye, total misnomer. They should, you know, we artists need to come up with a better term than the white of the eye because it's misleading and it makes us think like, oh, but it's the white of the eye. It should be white. No, it should be dark <laughs> because our um, eye socket is casting shadow over it. And even if it isn't, it's still not going to be as, as white as um, the sheet of paper. Like maybe if you have a specular reflection on the eyeball somewhere, that will um, be allowed to have to have some light light but not the white of the eye so if you can think of something um, a, a new name for the white of the eye um, we should have a contest. I'll give you something if you come up with something good. <laughs> you can you can tag me on Instagram. Um, it's like I came up with a great new name. Tag me at Kira Studios, and if if I like it, I have some cool art books that I can send out. Um, I don't know. Maybe I'll send you an apple. The apple of the eye. So the contest is finding a better word for the white of the eye. That's my call to action for you tonight. So I'm placing that eyebrow in at this moment, like very late in the game. Again, um, because I consider that local value. Um, it's not so much a structural thing. It's more a tonal thing. And gosh, I'm looking at the time it's almost up and I'm going to wrap this up with just a summary.
So you can either write down notes to yourself about anything that you can take away from this cross contour hatching thing. Lesson, that would be the word. <laughs> okay. And she has no hair, what the hell? <laughs> I always say that, oh, maybe I'll finish it up later and then post it. And maybe I will, but I probably won't because if I do have time to draw, I just want to draw on my own things. And I want to go back to the push ups. Yeah, let's do it like this. Let's do like a super fast, let there be tone. And then, of course, we need that headband. I know I'm going over time-wise. Here, I'm going to put a little pit shadow underneath that headband so we know. Maybe I should do more of the speed drawing. I feel like when I draw quickly, more quicker, I make more energetic judgments. And I think that's why Groza's stuff looks so cool because he's just like, Shh, you know, putting some life behind it. I have a very, um, you know, I like schedules, I like order, I like thinking things through. So that's kind of my personality. And I, you know, I'm fine with it. Nothing to bemoan, but you know, it's good to like be aware of like, hey, what's your tendency? and then kind of build in moments to counter your tendencies. Okay, <laughs> there's a little wild, wild going to town towards the end. So let me switch cameras real quick. There I am. Um, hope, I hope you got a good drawing out of this. So um, let me review a few points that you can jot down for yourself. Let me just see, I see some more comments, one sec. Holbein, oh my gosh, yeah, Holbein is another great one. The very light raw umbra of the eye. <laughs> it's a contender, it's a contender, so keep them coming. Um, a new word for the white of the eye that doesn't include the word white, because it's not white. I mean, technically it is, but you know, whatever. All right, so review. Um, when we want to build midtones that reflect um, the, the value transitions out of the shadows to the highlights, we want to think about the head as facets. So like you think about, okay, the head in its like simplest form is an egg. That's the first thing. Where on that rounded egg is the light hitting most directly? Become aware of that first. That's your number one thing. Which things are getting hit by light? Which parts of the egg where can the light rays not reach anymore? Gives you your light shadow separation, right? Um, once you got that, and if there is none, like if it's a frontal lit thing, um, then you skip to the second point. The second point is think about the face in terms of facets. Like literally just like um, take a piece of paper and bend it and like kind of play accordion with it and see how the light interacts with the different facets. That's how our face is. And then kind of search on your reference which facets um, are brightest. So if it's right here, then it means the light's coming from the top. If it's right here, the light's coming more from the front. If it's down here, then you have a downlit situation. So think about these facets and then angle your pencil in direction with the facets. Um, let's see. Of course, you want to have a solid underdrawing because otherwise your facets are going to be all over the place. That's the third point. And the fourth point is you need to have a really good pencil paper combo. If your pencils are too smudgy, it's going to be hard to keep that, um, that linear structure going uh, without blurring it all over the place. Um, and then the last thing in terms of like once you got your facets felt out, you're letting your hand feel the facets. Um, and you're trying to figure out, well, how dark do I let them get? You need to look relationally. You cannot just look 
at the one single area that you have in mind um, in isolation. That's not how value works. Value only works relationally, so it's best to compare two values that touch, let your eye hop back and forth, asking yourself which one is lighter, which one is darker. And then the best thing is to triangulate, find a third, um, especially one that you know is crazy dark. So let me see, I see some more comments. More Drucker, I've heard that name, but I can't think of something. Sclera of the eye, I know that's, that's, that's very technical. I wanna come up with like something creative, nerdy, nutty. <laughs> that's the flavor I'm looking for, nerdy, nutty. <laughs> Can you go with that? Um, <laughs> oh, Hannah said something that I missed, oh no. I wish I, I, I wish I caught it. I, I don't get grossed out easily. So maybe, maybe, maybe Instagram me. Let's see if there's anything else I missed. <laughs> okay. Well, this was fun. Thanks for hanging out with me. Um, if you, Mad Magazine. If you if you want to um, share your work, I would love to see it. If if um, you want to tag me on Instagram at Cura Studios, um, you can either DM me with it or you can just post it on your feed and and, and put my name in there so I can see it. Or you can uh, put it into my Facebook group. It's called Cura Time. Um, and if you want feedback, I'll give you feedback on it. You can just tell me, Hey, Carolyn, I was at your sketch session. Here's what I came up with. Give me some feedback. Um, Let's see, hold on. Muddy cream. I thought the yolk of the eye. But I like that. The yolk of the eye. Like yolk and then like you just need to make it like a beige. Like the... I don't know. I can't... The anemic. The anemic yolk of the eye. Okay, we're getting really gross here. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say, if you're not already on my email list, Get yourself on my email list. You get weekly emails that are fun and entertaining. And when you sign up, you get a free workbook um, where you can make your drawings immediately better by using three really powerful questions on your drawings. Um, and the way you can get onto the email list is by going to curaoc.com forward slash three questions. So you get a free work workbook and you get all the weekly emails updating you on what the next sketch, sketch session is, um, focusing on and um, kind of tips on creativity and drawing. So um, you should be on it because I want to talk to you more. Let's see. <laughs> Alrighty. I'm out of here. Thanks so much for hanging out with me. I want to see your drawings and I want to see you next week for drawing nature things. Uh, I'm going up to the mountain so I'll have much reference. So I'll see you soon and take care. Good night. <laughs>